it's Clay. Welcome to another video. This time I want to talk about guitar amp simulation plugins. You are running an electric guitar and you're running an instrument cable. You may be into some sort of audio interface or other device like that. It's totally silent in the room and you're using plugins or VST software or standalone software of some kind to get a guitar tone, probably using headphones. Uh, but maybe you're not entirely satisfied with your experience and you're wanting to maybe get a little bit of a improvement in the sound quality. What I want to talk about today is some of the tips that I would have for you as to how you can maybe get a better experience. And what I don't necessarily want you to do is to get bogged down in the minutia of the choices that I make. For example, that I'm using Reaper or that I'm using a Focusrite interface or that I'm using S-Gear as my amp sim software. Instead, I want to focus on making tips that are generally applicable to all people that are using um, guitar plugins of any kind. And, and hopefully this can help you regardless of what you're using because I really do believe that some of these tips might be applicable to you. So um, I want to offer four tips that I think will help. So let's go ahead and get started. For tip number one, it is going to be to use a DAW. Uh, DAW stands for Digital Audio Workstation. And my DAW of choice is Reaper. It's what you see me using right here. And now using a DAW is um, really powerful. It's a really powerful way to record, edit, and modify audio of any kind. And just in my opinion, it opens up so many doors and is important for the subsequent tips that I'll have in this video. Um, the alternative is to use a, a standalone plugin, right? So you've just got your VST as an, as an app on your desktop maybe that you open up and you use it directly that way. That is okay. But in my experience, to really open up the possibilities of a guitar plugin, you want to use it within the context of a DAW. Now, um, like I said, I use Reaper. I would highly recommend it. I think it's very good and appropriate for new people that are new to this kind of experience. And so uh, I would recommend it. But just be aware there is a little bit of a learning curve involved with that. I do have other videos on my channel you can check out about how to get started using Reaper. Um, but that's my first recommendation is using it within a DAW allows you to supplement or add on to a lot of other cool things that help get the most out of this amp sim simulation. So that's tip number one is to use a DAW. I like to use Reaper and go from there. All right, let's talk about tip number two. And that is going to be about gain staging correctly. Now, what I'm talking about with gain staging is anywhere you've got a volume control or a level control of any kind, it's really important to think about how you are setting those across your setup. Now, when you take a guitar and you plug it into a guitar amplifier, uh, that process is basically just set for you, right? Um, you just plug it in and you're good to go and your, your gain stage is what it is. Now maybe you set your pedals or your amps, but all of that is done subsequent. But if you think about the signal process between on a DI setup using an amp sim, you've got a guitar running into a cable that's maybe running into an audio interface. Now that interface, when you run that quarter inch instrument cable in, is going to send the signal through a preamp. And you've got a level control, probably a gain control or a volume control on your preamp. And it's important that you set that level correctly. Next, if you go into your, you know, so that, that, that interface will convert the signal after the preamp into a digital signal, send it via your USB cable into your computer, and then you've got your plug-in. Now I'm using S-Gear, and if you will look, I've got an input control over here, and every soft VST software I've ever experienced that as guitar amp sim has some sort of input and output control and in my experience these are very important so the way you set the gain or the volume control on your audio interface and then next how you set your input control is extremely and crucially important to the functionality of your amp so I just want to demonstrate that for a second now what I like to do is if I play my guitar I will um, just play a really loud G chord. Now if you will look, 
at this audio signal that I just created. You can see I'm getting a pretty healthy level. I think I'm peaking here at maybe five decibels, negative five. I'm peaking here at negative 4.6, that's fine. Frankly, I could even take it down a little bit just to make sure that I don't, I could take it down just a touch, make sure I don't clip anything. So now I'm down at about negative eight. I think that's a pretty safe range. Even at a really loud part, I'm not gonna clip this signal. But um, if you go a little bit too far down, you could end up um, running into your amp in a very weak way. Um, meaning, you know, it's, it's almost as if you have a volume between your guitar cable and your amplifier and you set it to like negative 10 dB, the amp is gonna sound really thin and really bad. And likewise, if you set it too hot and you're clipping your audio interface, right? So if, I'll show you how that sounds. If I... Yikes. I mean, that doesn't sound good. You know, so I kind of like to get it to about negative... negative 10 or so. That seems to be a pretty good spot as far as the audio interface goes. Then, I find that you sometimes need to increase the input gain a little bit. So you can see I've got it here at plus three. If I set it down to zero, we listen to the amp. It sounds fine, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that, but I just recommend you play around with this input control. If I bump it up a little bit, what is happening is I'm hitting the front end of the amp a little bit harder. Now, what I um, like to do is I like to set this level based on my own personal knowledge and experience of guitar amplifiers. Um, using my own understanding of, for example, you know, if, if, uh, if I pull up the Custom 57, that amp is probably a little bit easier to tell it on, right? Um, if this is like a Tweed Deluxe 5E3, I know that if I'm at 3, 2 or 3 on the volume control, uh, it should be relatively clean, right? So let's just listen to that. Now, if I take away all my boost... Sounds good. But I know on this amp, if I get the volume up to about 5, it should start to really distort and compress. And to me, that's just a little bit lackluster. So I'm going to bring it up a little bit. And see, I'm adding a little touch of grit now at about plus four. You know, so to me, that is getting the amp to a more realistic uh, level, right? So when I when I am using a real amp, what kind of l distortion am I expecting? And and so to me, uh, it's just really crucial that you play with your input control. And I find that sometimes you maybe need to add a little bit of input just to goose that front end a little bit more, and it gets the amp into a, a happier place. So that is tip number one. Now, uh, for tip number two, I'm actually going to go to a different plugin, and if you'll see here, this is my amp sim. I actually am just using the plugin for amp simulation. Speaker simulation is the next thing, and it is crucial. The effect that a speaker has on your tone in any setup is so incredibly powerful. I can't really overstate it. So what I like to do, I'm using a plugin called Pulse. Uh, by Rosen Digital. Now, again, this is something that you can really only do if you're using a DAW. So, I, if you think about this right here, these vertical vertical set of plugins, these are basically um, like a signal chain, starting at the top and then going for each plugin one by one all the way down to the bottom. So, I've got S gear in here in the middle. I don't have any speaker sim going on in S gear. I turn it off, and then I use Pulse 
to load impulse responses. They, those are highly accurate EQ curves, very detailed EQ curve captures of what real life speakers do. And I'm using some own hammer impulse responses. They have a free Mesa 412 that I recommend you check out. But I just bought one of their cab packs for like 20 bucks, like five years ago, and I love it. I use it all the time, and I would highly recommend it because, in my experience, one of the hugest differentiating factors in modeling units of all kinds is how they do speaker cabinet modeling. The more um, poor sounding amp modelers tend to have very subpar speaker modeling. So, by disabling the stock speaker simulation and using high quality impulse responses with a plugin like Rosen Digital's Pulse. Again, this is a free plugin and you can check out Own Hammer. There's a whole bunch of other good ones too. Um, but that's just, this is just what I use. This, in my opinion, takes it to another level. Um, you know, I'm right here, I'm mixing a, a dynamic mic like a 57 with a microphone placed in the rear, which is a recording technique that I've seen a lot of pros use. And again, it just adds an element of realism to the to the tone that I find to be really, really helpful. So I recommend you use impulse responses for the speaker sim. All right, next, my next tip going along is to use reverb. Now, I'm mostly talking about when I'm just playing at home, jamming, trying to get a pleasing experience, an experience that is... Um, inspiring for me to sit down and play on. If you're recording, obviously you want to set things however you want to set it for that track. But I'm just talking about uh, if I've got headphones on, I want to get an experience that is really pleasant to play into. And for me, reverb is critical. Uh, reverb simulates, can help simulate what the room does. You know, when you're sitting and you've got an amplifier next to you, what you're really hearing is partially the, the, the audio waves that are coming out of the speaker right into your ear, but I also guarantee that you're hearing a lot of reflections. These are audio waves that are coming out of the speaker and bouncing off of walls and ceilings and book shelves and, and couches and windows, and then they're all kind of mushing together and hitting your ear, and it creates a very vibrant experience that we're very used to. And so reverb can help to simulate that. So highly recommend you use some reverb uh, to give a sense of roominess to your sound. And, and oftentimes I find that I set the reverb a little bit higher than I normally otherwise would just to try and give myself that sense of space. So I'm using Valhalla Vintage Reverb, and we'll just listen to that here for a second. I think it sounds really good. <laughs> And so for me, that really takes it to another level. Whereas if I just run it dry, it will sound like this. And to me, that is just not nearly as pleasing. All right, my next tip has to do with compression. Now, what I'm talking about here is I like to use a compressor in my signal chain. And what I'm looking for is, again, to provide an element of realism. When you are playing with a tube guitar amplifier, there is very, very frequently an element of compression, natural tube compression going on. When you get the volume going and it's loud, there is compression happening in the tubes, the rectifier tube, the power tubes. They start to sag. They start to kind of give a little bit, squish a little bit, provide this experience that's very, um, you, know, you dig into a note and it kind of kind of struggles and fights to, to keep up and then, then the note blooms and opens up in a really pleasing, pleasant way. And again, when we're plugging in direct, we don't have that same kind of, you know, tactile experience with the amp pushing these loud sound waves. There's no sound in the room to, to help you with that. So I find a compressor. I'm using Blockfish, and I'm using it early in the chain before s -cure. And Blockfish is a compressor that I like. It's free. You can use any compressor. I just like Blockfish because it is a colorful compressor, meaning it's not trying to be transparent and clear. 
it is very much trying to help color the signal. I like to use an optical style because that has more of a natural attack. And I like to use a little bit of compression with these settings. I give it a little bit of an output boost as well because I like how it sounds. It's it again pushes the front end of the amp a little bit more. It gives you that sense of of of, of you know fighting and kind of uh, the amp is is kind of breathing and reacting into your when you really dig in it kind of fights back. Um, so I'm just going to play for a little bit and show you what the compressor sounds like on and off. <laughs> Now with it off. So to me, the compressor just helps to, again, simulate some of what you're getting uh, from a tube amp-like experience. And I find that all of these things combined together tend to promote a really uh, more rich experience that is more inspiring and that really helps to get me uh, to enjoy what I'm what I'm playing through so I hope some of these tips help if you have some tips of your own please leave them down in the comments section if you have any thoughts or comments about anything I went over in this video please let me know find the links in the description to everything I discussed here if you want to look it up yourself and I uh, hope to see you again soon thanks bye <music>